Hello everybody! In this video I want to talk to you about the buffer tool, the buffer operation. And in many ways it seems like the buffer tool is the quintessential GIS operation because whenever people are talking about GIS tools and doing GIS it always seems like the buffer tool comes up. So we might as well start with it and uh, talk about it first. So what does the buffer tool do? Well most fundamentally, what the buffer tool is going to allow you to do is it's going to return to you all of the areas that are within a certain distance of some feature or features. Okay, So for each one of these tools, we're going to be looking at what are acceptable inputs to the tool, and when you uh, input something into the tool, what do you get back out? So we'll be thinking in terms of inputs and outputs. So let's take a look at what acceptable inputs are for the buffer tool. And we can see that we can input uh, points, lines, and areas into the buffer tool, and we can get this uh, geometric result. What we do is we specify a buffer distance, and this is the radius uh, for the buffers that we would like to create. So for instance, here is the input and the output when we execute a buffer operation on a uh, point, line, and area, input and output. Uh, and by the way, we can also create variable distance buffers if we're buffering all of the features in a particular data file because we can specify this buffer distance based on a value in the attribute table. So that way uh, they don't all have to have the same distance. If we have, have the buffer distance that we would like around each particular feature stored in the attribute table, we can specify that the buffer tool should use that distance in the table uh, when running all of these buffers. So that seems very straightforward, doesn't it? Here's the input. We need a distance around that particular feature, and we get this output. And it is straightforward. That's the buffer tool in, uh, in its core functionality. That's what it does. So, But when I show this in the classroom, here's the buffer tool. Here's what it puts out. Uh, students frequently will raise their hand. I'll have somebody raise their hand and ask, OK, well, now why would I ever want to do that? Why would I need to run a buffer operation uh, in my uh, GIS. Well, okay, now see, this is exactly what I'm talking about when I'm saying that these are abstract tools and we need to understand them in the abstract, but then we also need to come up with reasons in your particular area of application as to why you would want to do this. So uh, why, uh, why would you use a buffer? In what situations would you need to compute this kind of geometry? Well, I can think of lots of examples myself. So what if you were trying to establish the area that is a prohibited airspace around a particular location? So what if I told you that uh, there is prohibited airspace uh, of one nautical mile all, all around the uh, vice president's mansion? So then if I give you this point vector file and say here is the location of the vice president's mansion and then I say I've got uh, restricted airspace within one nautical mile all the way around the mansion, how do you come up with where the boundaries of the restricted airspace are? Well, this is a buffer operation. I'm going to take the input point and then I'm going to buffer it with a buffer distance of one nautical mile. Here's the output and it returns to me all of that uh, restricted airspace. Uh, another example here that I had a student give me once was uh, blackout areas around uh, ball game stadiums. I don't know a whole lot about that, uh, but I was being told that sometimes a, a stadium or a television broadcast of a, a ball game will be blacked out within a certain distance around the stadium because they're trying to encourage people if they're close by the stadium to come buy a ticket and then go to the uh, stadium and watch the game live. So they'll black out uh, television broadcasts of the game from within a certain distance of the stadium. Well, how would you compute this blackout area? Well, it's possible that it, you could do it this way. This is a buffer operation around a stadium. Well, in what circumstances might you want to buffer a line? Well, I can easily think of all different uh, kinds of things that uh, might use this type of operation as well. But what about uh, the regulations that say 
uh, there are certain kinds of activities that must or must not take place within a certain distance of a stream or a river. There, there are lots of different rules and regulations about that way. You know, if they're trying to protect the stream or a stream is protected or a river is protected, they'll, they'll tell you what kinds of things you can and can't do within a certain distance of it. So, for instance, sometimes there's a riparian protection zone around a stream. Uh, that must remain vegetated, for instance. Maybe you can't uh, cut down the trees or maybe you need to go plant trees within this riparian uh, zone around any particular the, a protected stream. So if you find out that you have to have this 50-foot uh, vegetated uh, area within 50 feet of the stream, well, how can you find out exactly where this, uh, this protection zone, this riparian zone, this uh, vegetated zone needs to be. Well, easy. If you've got a line file that shows where the stream is, then buffer the stream by 50 feet and you can tell where the, uh, the protected zone must be. Well, what about buffering an area? We can buffer areas as well. That's valid input uh, to the buffer uh, operation. According to the law of the sea, as an example, uh, a state may claim territorial waters up to 12 miles from its established base coastline. So in, within that area, that territorial water, the states are free to set laws and enforce laws and use all of the resources there within. So what if I were trying to find out where the territorial waters are of a particular island, but I have this vector data file of this uh, island, this uh, area geometry right here. Well, all I have to do is run a buffer around it at a distance of 12 nautical miles, and I can find out where are, uh, where, or where are the boundaries of the state's uh, territorial waters. So those are uh, three examples of taking the buffer tool and applying it to some domain. And I'm sure you can think of lots of examples yourself. But I hope that these uh, really help you establish the difference between understanding the buffer tool abstractly and then understanding its uh, potential applications in particular domains. So in GIS, we're not going to have uh, you know, an identify protected airspace tool, probably. You know, that's not the way that a GIS software package is going to come. It's not going to come with that tool. We don't have uh, an identify protected vegetation area tool to run around the stream. Likewise, I don't have an a, a identify territorial waters tool. But that's okay. I don't need that. Uh, I just need the buffer tool. The rules for constructing the geometry of the output file that I need are going to be the same regardless of the application area. And that's why it's an abstract tool. I just need to have those, that tool, those rules, stored in, the abstract, st stored in the abstract tool in my GIS, and then I can go and get that tool whenever I need it for any of my uh, application areas. Okay, so one thing that is very important that I want to point out about the buffer tool here is that it's much more sophisticated than just running a circle around a point. Uh, it's not just uh, taking that point that represented the vice president's mansion and then drawing a circle around it at a distance of one nautical mile. The buffer operation is more complex than that, uh, and it's important to understand why, but you should realize why it has to be more sophisticated than that. When we think back to everything that we learned about projections and the kinds of information that they store and what information they don't. So as an example of, about this, let's take a look here at the Robinson projection. We know the Robinson projection is a compromise projection. It's suitable for displaying general reference information about the entire planet. Uh, and we did note that even though you may have a map of the Robinson projection, uh, created with the Robinson projection, it may give you a scale, the display scale of the map, but it's important to realize that that display scale is not accurate at all places across the map. It's only accurate at the line of tangency that was used to create uh, this particular projection, in this example here at the equator. As you move away from the equator, the scale changes. And we said that we can easily tell that when we take a look at this projection, uh, because it's obvious when we go up to the North Pole and down to the South Pole that the scale just isn't making sense anymore. There's, the scale is definitely not constant because the North and South Poles are not several hundred kilometers or several thousand kilometers long each. They're zero dimensional points. So the scale is definitely changing as we move away from the equator. It's not constant. Uh, this is a projection that does not 
not preserve projection, uh, does, does not preserve distance rather, and that should be uh, obvious to you as a compromise projection. It's not uh, preserving any kind of information anyway. It's a compromise projection. But that does mean that if we wanted to know, for example, all areas that are within, say, 500 miles of Australia, that we cannot just take this map take a look at the scale, and then draw a circle, you know, find out its distance like we've uh, worked with, and then draw that circle around Australia using that scale. Uh, it should be obvious to you that if you did that, you would get the wrong answer. We, we would not have uh, all areas within 500 miles of Australia because we didn't take into account the distortion of distance that it was caused uh, by the projection. So that's what the buffer operation does. The buffer operation is designed to take that into account. So if you need to run a buffer around a point, for instance, uh, then what should happen is that a equidistant projection needs to be created that is centered on the point to be buffered. So if you've got a buffer at this point, we need an equidistant projection and that centered on that point and that will allow you to measure out from that central point accurately in any direction. So once you have that set up and you know the scale, well then I could draw a buffer around that point. And yes, when set up like this, in this particular projection, you take a look at that buffer of that point and it would look like a circle. Uh, but then as soon as I take this projection or take this data and I put it into a different projection, maybe that's not how I want to look at it. I need it in a different projection. Uh, as soon as we do that, this buffer, this shape, is going to become distorted. It won't be perfectly circular. And you and I understand that uh, because we've been through GIS, we've been looking at projections, we've been studying them, and so we understand, well, why is this, this buffer of this point not a circle once you go to a different projection? Well, it's because of the distortion of distance. Uh, but whereas we understand this, that may be something that isn't understood or something that's missed uh, by people who are not familiar with the distortion that is introduced into geographic data because of projections. So let me go ahead and, and give you what's become sort of the quintessential example of uh, making a mistake in this regard. And it comes from The Economist magazine and specifically the issue that was published on May 3rd, 2003. And in that issue, there was an article about uh, a, the missile systems that North Korea is developing. And of course, the range of these missiles was uh, very important as far as to why they was getting international attention. Uh, and they could be this, these missile systems could be geopolitically significant because of their long range. And so if you're writing an article in a magazine about the, the development of these missiles, it seems very natural that you would probably want to include uh, a map that shows how far the missiles can shoot. And so that's exactly what they did. Uh, here's the map that was published. So here we've got North Korea and we've got three different range rings for these missiles. So let's take a look at, at what's going on here. We've got three different missile systems with three different ranges. The short, uh, missile, uh, short range missile system is supposed to be able to go out to this yellow line. And then the medium range missile goes out to the red line or to the edge of the blue, and then the long range goes out to the uh, red. So on a certain level, it would certainly seem to make sense that these uh, missile ranges, these range rings, would look circular because you would think, yeah, sure, the missiles can fly in uh, any direction the same amount of distance out from the center of North Korea. Uh, however, this is very wrong. They have showed, shown this information very inaccurately on this map, and it's because of the mistakes that uh, we were just talking about. The ranges should not be shown as circular on this map. This map uh, that was published didn't, didn't include a scale, uh, but we would know that with whatever projection this map was created with, and this economist map and the economist didn't communicate its projection information to us anyway, so it's very difficult for us to tell exactly what's going on with this map. But we would know that, okay, this map must have some projection, and its scale is only accurate along its line of tangency. Um, and then, but we can easily tell, even though we don't have all of the information about the projection that was used to create this map, uh, we can definitely tell that whatever projection this is, it's definitely distorting area. 
and therefore also distance, or it's also uh, distorting distance as you move toward the poles. You can take a look at this map and, and see that's what's going on. Uh, therefore, distance from the center of North Korea is not being preserved, and so these buffers are not circular. Uh, the Economist was called out about this particular cartographic error, and so in the next edition of the next issue, the, uh, the May 17th, 2003 issue, they issued a revised map. They printed a revised map for this information. And here is the revised map. It looks pretty different, doesn't it? Uh, and this is an extremely significant difference. Take a look at this. All of a sudden, Japan is threatened by even the short-range missile. All of Asia, almost all of Europe, uh, a swath of Africa, Australia, and Canada, a large portion of the United States is within range of the medium-range uh, missile. The long-range missile can reach the rest of Europe, the rest of Africa, and the rest of the United States. So now, once the buffers have been run accurately, we have a much better understanding of why the international community uh, was so concerned about the development of these missile systems. So now, of course, on this map, these buffers do not look circular. You and I understand exactly why they don't look circular on this map. This is because of the projection. The projection is heavily distorting uh, the buffers. But that is not obvious to somebody who hasn't studied maps and the distortion introduced by projections. Uh, so you can also see a little bit in here about how this projection is distorting this information. You can see that the buffer of the short-range missile is least distorted. It's no longer circular, it's, it's oval, uh, and it's a little bit squashed in the east-west direction, but it's not nearly as distorted as some of the other buffers. The medium and the long-range buffers uh, become extremely distorted, especially as you move to the poles. Okay, so there you go. Now you know and understand why the buffer operation is actually more complex than just drawing circles on a map. It takes into account uh, the curvature of the Earth and any distortion that has been introduced because of the uh, projection. There's a lot more that we could talk about uh, the construction of a buffer, how does it go about it, what's actually the procedure, but we'll do that in another class. So there you go. Executing a buffer operation is more sophisticated than just drawing a circle on a map, and now you understand why. The buffer operation has to take into account the curvature of the Earth and also any distortion that's being uh, introduced into the map because of the projection that's being used. There is a lot more we could say about that, as uh, about how the buffer operation actually does what it does, uh, how buffers should be constructed, but we're not going to get into that information here in this video series. We'll have to get into that into a, a, a more advanced class in GIS. Oh, but I will say that uh, these kinds of maps about missile ranges are pretty common. Uh, whenever uh, someone's talking about uh, missile systems and their range, whether it's for a magazine or on a blog or someplace else, you see maps of this kind uh, very frequently. And I found that students, after they have uh, learned this information, when they see one, a map like this, they tend to want to check it. So they fire up GIS and we'll see whether or not they can replicate what exactly it is that they saw on the, the magazine or the blog. And that's fun to do because sometimes it's very surprising to find out what you find uh, uh, and that it hasn't been done as accurately as you think. Okay, so that's the buffer tool. It returns to us all of the areas that are within a certain distance of some feature or features. That's what it does for uh, the geometry that it creates in a new file. And we've looked at it on the abstract level. Here is what the tool does. But then we've also talked about uh, why we might want to use it. Uh, you know, we're not just manipulating geometry here and creating new vector files just for the sake of uh, having some more vector data files on our computer. We want to be able to uh, apply the buffer tool to solve some kind of problem or answer some kind of question that we've got. Uh, so think about it in both of those ways. We'll move on to the next uh, geoprocessing tool in the next video.